Thanks be to you, Almighty God, Father God, Son of God, Jesus the Christ, holy and beautiful and awesome Spirit. Thanks be to you. Thanks be to you for this day of life. Thanks be to you for this time of worship and praise. Thanks be to you for this moment in this service when we hear a reflection, a present day reflection, meditation on your word. We pray, oh God, I pray from the bottom of my heart that it is proper in your sight. Please, God, make it so. Thank you for your word that we just read. Please inspire us all. As we hear what we pray, I pray you have to say to each of us at this time on this glorious and home Sunday. For in the holy name of your only begotten Son, Jesus, we pray. Amen. It was one of the most inspirational moments in all of World War II, and there were many inspirational moments in World War II, but this is one of the tops for sure. Four chaplains were standing on the deck of the USS Dorchester, and they were standing next to each other, hand in hand, and they were singing a hymn, Nearer, My God, to Thee. And this was a scene the men of the USS Dorchester would never forget. The chaplain's names were George Fox, Alexander Good, Johnny Washington, and Clark Poley. It was a stirring sight to see these four men united hand in hand on the deck of that ship. Let me tell you why. They weren't conducting a service as you might think. They were preparing to die. It was in the early morning hours of February 3rd, 1943. The ship was bound for Greenland with 906 men on board. A torpedo from a Nazi U-boat ripped through the hull and the ship began to sink in the icy waters of the Atlantic. Fear gave way to panic among the soldiers, and rushing to the deck, many left their life jackets below. The chaplains helped calm the panic by helping the men escape the sinking ship. Then the lifeboats, full of soldiers, full of soldiers, they, the chaplains, do you know what they did? They gave their own life jackets to the soldiers who didn't have any. The ship sank to the bottom of the ocean in only 27 minutes. As the men who had escaped looked back at their doomed ship, you know what they saw? They saw the four chaplains standing on the deck of that ship, hand in hand, singing praises to Almighty God. What was it Jesus has told, has told us in John chapter 15, verse 13? Greater love has no one than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. On Palm Sunday some 2,000 plus years ago, Jesus was riding into Jerusalem to do just that. To lay down his life for his friends and also his enemies. And what began with Jesus' triumphant entry into Jerusalem would culminate on a brutal cross on a hill of Calvary. You see, that was his destiny. That was his purpose. It was the reason the Father sent him to earth in the first place. It was a moment chosen for him before the foundation of the world. As one man put it, quote, Forget any suggestion that Jesus was trapped. Erase any theory that Jesus made a miscalculation. Ignore any speculation that the cross was a last-ditch attempt to salvage a dying mission. Jesus died on purpose. No surprise, no hesitation, no faltering. 
The journey to Jerusalem didn't begin in Galilee. In fact, the journey to Jerusalem didn't even begin in Bethlehem. The journey to the cross began long before as Adam took that piece of forbidden fruit, put it to his mouth, and took that first bite. And as Jesus rode into Jerusalem on the back of that donkey, He's fulfilling what He was sent to do. Ultimately, it would culminate in His brutal death on a brutal cross on the hill called Calvary. On the, hill called Calvary. the Jewish historian Josephus tells us that over two million people were involved in the great Passover feast. It is known that 256,500 lambs were slain at one Passover and that each lamb represented at least 10 Jewish worshipers. Which would mean, brothers and sisters, that at least 2,565,000 people were in attendance. They were all in an area, believe it or not, smaller than downtown land. As you can imagine, the housing, the sanitation requirements, and the food arrangements for this mass of millions would be extraordinary. Just picture the scene in your minds. Tens of thousands of Jews jamming into the streets of this city, all at once getting ready to celebrate the Passover. And while all of this was happening, Jesus is just outside the city gates. He's entering into Jerusalem on the back of a donkey. This too was not mere chance. It was prophesied about him some 550 years earlier by the prophet Zechariah as he wrote, quote, Rejoice greatly, O Zion. By the way, Zion means city of David or city of God. Rejoice greatly, O Zion, O daughter of Zion. Shout in triumph, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just, and he is endowed with salvation, humble and mounted on a donkey, even on a colt, the foal of a donkey. It was all prophesied, and it was being fulfilled. As Jesus rode into the city of Jerusalem on that first Palm Sunday, no doubt many in that crowd knew that the prophecy of Zechariah had reached fruition. Many in that crowd that day knew that Jesus was the Christ, the Messiah, the fulfillment of all Old Testament prophecy. That's why they laid their coats on the road before him. And before they laid their coats on the road before him, the Bible tells us they put their coats on the donkey. And then they put Jesus himself on the donkey. Many of them who didn't have coats, remember what they did? They cut branches as they were traveling. They cut branches off of trees and they took those branches and they laid those branches down in front of Jesus Christ as he's riding on the back of that donkey. Again, they were essentially rolling out the red carpet for not a king, but the king, the king of kings and the lord of lords. They were using what they had to do so. And then came their shouts of praise. Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. They shouted this over and over and over and over and over again. And by the way, those words are also prophetic. They come straight from Psalm 118, verse 26. But sad to say, not everyone there that day was shouting glories and praises to God. No, 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 not everyone. Mm -mm. Not everyone there that day believed Jesus was the Messiah. If you read Matthew's account of Palm Sunday, there were people that day who asked this question. As Jesus was going right into Jerusalem, they asked the question, Who is this? Who is this? See, the truth is, for some in that crowd, Jesus was a 
miracle worker. They'd seen it before, they'd heard about it. For some of the crowd, Jesus was a great teacher. That's what rabbi means, teacher. For some in that crowd, he was a prophet, a modern day prophet. For some in the crowd, he was a great healer. Again, some of them in that crowd that day had witnessed Jesus' healing power. And many of them, if not most, have heard of it. To others, however, he was indeed the Messiah. He was indeed the Son of the living God. No, not everyone there that day understood Jesus to be the Savior of the world. Remember the Pharisees? They certainly did. The Pharisees, when Jesus was coming into Jerusalem, do you remember what they said to him? They said to him, they said, Teacher! Notice they call him Teacher, not Savior, right? That's what Rabbi means once again. Teacher, rebuke your disciples. Rebuke them. Remember what he said? If they keep quiet, these stones will cry out. It was time, brothers and sisters. It was time. In God's perfect timing, this was it. Pharisees, so narrow-minded, so arrogant, so self-centered, so prideful, so self-absorbed. How arrogant these so-called men of God were. I mean, these were the same men who liked to stand in the temple and pray out loud. I'm talking out loud to the top of their voices so that everyone around could hear how righteous they were. You can almost hear them now. Thank you, God, that I'm so righteous. Thank you, God, that I'm so good. Thank you, God, that I follow the law to a T. Thank you, God, that I know the Old Testament Scriptures back and forth. Thank you, God, that I'm so generous. I give a, a, a tithe of all that I get to you. Thank you, God. Shouted it so everyone else could hear it. These were the same men Jesus called whitewashed tombs. Whitewashed tombs, why? Because they looked so put together on the outside, yet on the inside, they were as worthless and dead as a rotting, decaying corpse. These Pharisees, these hypocrites, were jealous of Jesus. They were jealous of his popularity. Oh, yeah, yeah, that happens, doesn't it? They were jealous of his authority. In fact, they were intimidated by it. Oh yeah, that little ego getting in the way there. They were threatened by his influence. Oh, he had many, many more people coming around him to listen to what he had to say as opposed to them. They hated him. They hated him. They hated him with a passion. In fact, they hated him so much, they wanted him dead. And that is exactly why for three straight years, they did everything they could, trying to trap him here, trying to trap him there. In order to kill him, most of the time they wanted him stoned to death. But see, that wasn't his destiny. On the following Friday, Friday following his entry into Jerusalem, they got what they wanted. Killed him. Brothers and sisters, here's the greatest irony in history. In all of history. The Friday following Palm Sunday, when they nailed Jesus to that cross, they were fulfilling His destiny. They didn't know it at the time, and many of them didn't know it afterwards, but they were fulfilling God's plan of salvation. They were fulfilling the very reason the Father sent Him to earth in the first place. And what was that reason? to do for us what no government, 
no politician, no king, no prince, no queen ever could do, and that is to be our substitute. To take upon himself our condemnation to die the death we deserve to die. To impute upon himself all of our sins and to impute and, and, and to impute upon us all of his holiness and righteousness. You say, but Austin, what exactly does that mean? What exactly does it mean? He imputed upon us all of His holiness and righteousness and imputed upon Himself all of our sinfulness. What does that mean? Brothers and sisters, this is what it means right here. Imagine Jesus Christ hanging on the cross of Calvary. Picture that in your mind. Imagine what you think that might look like. Imagine Him on the cross. Do you know what you see? That's a gossiper hanging there. That's a murderer hanging there. That's a thief hanging there. That's a pervert. That's an alcoholic. It's a drug addict. It's a child molester. Every vile and repulsive sin we can possibly imagine is right there on that cross. That's who is there. You say, oh, 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 hold it, Austin. Hold it, Matt. Hey, man, you, you finally crossed the line. Don't you dare, Austin, don't you dare lump my Jesus, my holy, perfect, pure, stainless, righteous Jesus with all of those evil doers. Don't you dare do that. Brothers and sisters, I didn't. He did. He did. And more than place his name in the same sentence with them, he placed himself in their place. And our place. As Jesus entered Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, that's what awaited him. Yet, you know what? He still wrote on. He wrote on knowing that many of those people shouting, Hosanna! Glory in the highest! Hosanna in the highest heaven! Praise be to God for the King of kings and the Lord of lords! He knew good and well that many, if not most, of those people shouting that on Palm Sunday would be shouting this on Friday following. Release Barabbas! Release Barabbas! Kill him! Kill this Jesus! Crucify him! Crucify him! He knew it. And yet he still wrote on. He knew exactly what was coming. And what was coming? What was coming was precisely what the chief priest, the Sanhedrin, the Roman authorities, and most of those people in the crowd that day wanted, and that was his death. They wanted him dead and gone for good. And they would get it by crucifixion, nonetheless. I've been reading a wonderful book. I recommend it to you all. It's called The Murder of Jesus by John MacArthur. And I was reading, as I was reading it last week, I came across this. Have you ever heard of a complete description of crucifixion, what Jesus would have gone through? Truman Davis, a medical doctor, describes in detail exactly what happened. Exactly what Jesus knew awaited him in just a few short days. I'm going to share this with you. It's worth remembering. Again, this is what he endured according to Dr. Truman Davis. As the arms fatigue, great waves of cramps sweep over the muscles, knotting them in deep, relentless, throbbing pain. With these cramps come the, comes the inability to push himself upward. Hanging by his arms, the pectoral muscles are paralyzed and the intercostal muscles are unable to act. Air can be drawn into the lungs but cannot be exhaled. 
Jesus fights to raise himself in order to get even one short breath. Finally, carbon dioxide builds up in the lungs and in the bloodstream, and the cramps partially subside. Spasmodically, he is able to push himself upward to exhale and bring in the life-giving oxygen. Hours of this limitless pain, cycles of twisting, joint-rending cramps, intermittent partial asphyxiation, searing pain as tissue is torn from his lacerated back as he moves up and down against the rough timber. Then another agony begins, a deep crushing pain in the chest as the pericardium uh, slowly fills with serum and begins to compress the heart. It is now almost over. The loss of tissue fluid has reached a critical level. The compressed heart is struggling to pump heavy, thick, sluggish blood into the tissues. The tortured lungs are making a frantic effort to gasp in small gulps of air. The markedly dehydrated tissues send their flood of stimuli to the brain. Once strength or feeling in his legs was gone, he would be unable to push up in order to breathe. And death would occur quickly. That is why the Romans sometimes practiced crucifracture, the breaking of the legs below the knees, when they wanted to hasten the process. But the soldiers finding Jesus already dead, decided not to break his bones. Instead, they pierced his side with a spear to verify that he was dead. The blood in the water that flowed out showed that he was. The watery fluid was probably excess serum that had collected in the pericardium. The pericardium is the membrane that encloses the heart. The blood was an indicator that the spear pierced that the spear pierced the heart, or aorta, as well as the pericardium. The fact that blood and water came out separately from the same wound seems to indicate that death had occurred some period of time before the wound was inflicted, so that Christ's blood, even in the area of the heart, had already begun the process of coagulation. End quote. As Jesus rode into Jerusalem, he knew what was coming. He knew what awaited him. He knew it all. Yet he still rode on. He knew it all. And he didn't turn around and hightail it out of there. No, no. He rode. It was the price that had to be paid in order for us to be forgiven. It was the price that had to be paid in order for us to be acceptable in God's sight. It was the price that had to be paid in order for us to become right righteous with God. See, unrighteousness cannot enter into God's presence. Sin cannot enter into God's presence. He is open. This was the price that had to be paid for you and for me in order to become right, righteous, right, righteous with Him. It's the price for sin. What are the wages of sin? Remember in the Garden of Eden, when God told Adam and Eve, 
You do anything you want to go into that group, or else you will blood. That's the wage. They did it. We inherited it. We deserve to die for our sin. Jesus substituted himself as the payment for us. Jesus knew exactly what awaited him in four short days. Exactly. He saw it all. But he didn't turn around. He still rode on. Why? He did so to fulfill the mission the Father sent him to complete. He rode on into Jerusalem on that first Palm Sunday to take your place and to take mine. He rode on because our lives, our souls, and our destinies depend on that is why he wrote on. Let's bow the prayer, please. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for writing on. Thank you for not turning back. Thank you for going all the way to the cross, knowing every step of the way what awaited you. And you did it, you did it all for us. For us. To save us from death and hell to save our souls from eternal punishment. You did it to offer us eternity by your side. Thank you, Savior Jesus. Thank you. In your name we pray. And the children of God say,